All right, here we go. Chi Ali. What's up, baby? Welcome back. <laughs> Thank you, my bro. What's good? It's been some years. Yeah, we still here, though. Yeah, I mean, we actually did, uh, I think, your first interview after you got out of prison last time. Definitely. That was 2012. Right. Yeah. And, uh, you know, for everyone who's watching, you guys can go back and take a look for to sure. kind of see some of the Definitely raw was, emotion, you know. A lot, of, a lot of feedback. That was, you know, I was still new to everything, especially with all the social media stuff. So that was definitely yeah. a good look. No doubt, man. My pleasure. And, I mean, millions of people watched it. For sure. I mean, you know, the story got to be told. Yeah. Well, let's go ahead and, and talk about the story again, because you actually have a new documentary out. Right. Uh, it's called On the Strength, The Fabulous Chiali. Right. And uh, I saw it. Hell of a documentary. Thank you. Very well done. Thank you. Very well done. Like, it incorporates all the music and all the old footage and, and, you know, has a lot of the key people as well, man. Very dope documentary. Thank you. You know, hopefully by the time this runs, it's going to be picked up by one of the big right. major well, distribution, you know, distributors. We've been blessed. Um, it was picked up to premiere in the Beverly Hills Film Festival, which is premiering in tonight. And they put us, like, red carpet, like, prime time on the opening night. So that was definitely an excellent look. Um, we were shooting it since, I guess, 2014 or 15, maybe 2015, I think. Mm. Um, so we kind of been done with most of my footage. We just wanted to, we had to, you know, just catch up with certain people. And then it was, it was something my producers was doing on their side. Big shout out to uh, JB and my boy Tom, um, who did a wonderful job. I mean, they, they put a lot of work in it and. You know, when you first get up with dudes, especially when dudes is white, you don't know how they come in and and how, you know, how it's going to be. But, like, they've been, like, family, like, for real. Like, they've embraced me and my family and, and vice versa. And it's been a dope situation. And it's one of those situations that I'm really glad I, I, I accepted. Yeah, man. Well, let's go ahead and tell the story again. Well... More or less. I mean, let's go ahead and start in the beginning. Yeah, more or less. You know, it started in the Bronx. Started in the Bronx. Bronx, Co-op City. Co-op City. I'm from Co-op City. Born in Jacoby Hospital. Grew up in Co-op City. Um, It was, I guess, around the summer. I must have been about 11 or 12. So, talking about 80, 88, 89-ish. 88, 89-ish. Um, Latifa used to stay in Co-op City with her dancers, the Safari sisters, Allison and Kika. So that summer, they was just, it was just an exciting summer. At the time, La wasn't as big as she was now, but you know, Wrath of My Madness was big. But, you know, Moni used to be over there and then, you know, Special Ed, EPMD, the Jungle Brothers, like everybody, it was just like the, the clubhouse. Yeah. And, you know, for those that don't know, like Latifa was the first, like, I'm trying to think who I can compare it to. She was the first, like, kind of strong... Pro female, she was the first militant that, kind yeah, that of was artist, holding her own and not, you know, selling pussy or ba- you exactly know, showing, does not sell ass. sex. Yeah, was like I'm a strong black woman, yeah. and that's and that's like what ladies I'm pushing. first. She, ladies she, first. Yeah, she was pushing the movement. Yeah, you know, <laughs> she was pushing the movement early in the game, and you know, big shouts to her and Sha. Um, it was just a. Amazing for me, because you got to remember, I'm probably 11, 12 years old. So these are the motherfuckers that's on TV that when I come home from school, I'm doing my homework watching their videos. This is a time when, you know, Donnie Simpson, you was watching Video Soul for the two rap videos, you know, like, mm-hmm. I hope they don't show a whack one, you know what I mean? So it was like Latifa, MC Light, Special Ed, like, I was... These was like icons to me. So to be in this circumference, and then once I really started making the music to really be seen as a peer, that was that was amazing. Um, but you know, rewind a little bit. So through you know, and in my adventures in co-op with them, I got introduced to Shaq Kim and, and Baby Chris, rest in peace. And um, I really clicked with both of them. It just so happened Chris was from the Bronx, so. We just happened to be running around a little more, and he, when he would be in the area, he would come get me. I would he'd be like, "Yo, what you doing? Come on, we'll take a ride." And you know, he might have me in the studio or here or there with Black Sheep or with Red Alert, Jungle Brothers doing whatever, just bugging out, just taking me out of Co-op City, letting me see the world. And then 
it was a specific night. They had did some show at the Apollo, and I think one of the Jungle Brothers missed his flight from London. So I was like, uh, let me freestyle. Because, you know, they was trying to figure out how they were going to freak the show without Africa. And um, they was like, you're not going to be scared? I was like, nah. I was scared to death, though, you know. But um, I made it happen, and they brought me out. And that's really how it started. When I came off stage, Chris was like, yo, I'm going to sign you. And like a few weeks later, he, I guess, inked his deal with Relativity Records and his violated imprint, and I was the first artist he signed. Right, and Chris had a long history with the native tongues. Definitely. I mean, he, a lot of people look at him as the person who really put together the native tongues, like all he the different did, factions. Though, but he really did. I mean, like Red Alert is like the grandfather, the godfather mm -hmm. of it. But Chris really was the one that did the work. Like, you got to remember, he started from probably carrying records for Red Alert to road managing the Jungle Brothers to managing Black Sheep to managing Tribe. You know what I mean? So he is, I feel like Chris is definitely the, the glue that, that linked us all together. Mm -hmm. Chris in that house in Co-op City. Okay, so now you get signed as a 12-year-old rapper, basically. Shi Ali, and you're showing up on some things. I guess you showed up on Black Sheep's album, right? On Pastor one of the songs. That was the first appearance. Appearance. Yep. You know, via vinyl. Yep. Black Sheep goes on. Choice is yours is still being played to this day. Like right. one of the biggest hip hop songs ever. I say it's top ten. Top ten? Yeah, I'll put it up there. Top ten. You play that song as a DJ. I'll play that song anywhere, anywhere in the world, and people go crazy. Like I give it top ten. Decades that. later, <laughs> Eric B for president. Yeah, that, it's up you know, there. it's a funeral. So now you're rolling with really, I mean, one of the hottest, really the hottest crew at that time. It was almost like, if you compare it to this day, it would be like TDE or something. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like just where everyone's popping, and you right. got these big entities, and you know, tribe is huge, and Daylight's huge, and everything. So you. You signed this deal, and you put out your first album, and the name of it was the Fabulous Chiali. Fabulous Chiali, hey, ninety-two. Okay, and you go on tour. Went on tour with Criss Cross and MC Light, I think. Oh, MC Light. I believe Criss Cross MC. and MC Light. My okay. First tour. And Criss Cross was going platinum. They were at huge. the time. Them and Jermaine Dupri, they were huge. Huge. They were huge. What was it like? How old were you? 12, 13 at the time? I probably, by then, I was probably like 14, 15. 14, 15. And all these girls are going crazy. Like, were you were you having sex before the, these tours or, or no? Um, yeah, I think I start, probably started having sex around the time that I probably started hanging out with them. Because that's really when I started leaving the house on my own and with my friends and, you know, just going on adventures, be us walking the skate key mm -hmm. late at night or whatever. But that's when, you know, when you start exploring with girls and feeling out your royal oats. So I was definitely starting to feel myself about that time. Right. But when you're on stage, on a tour, that's a whole different oh, thing. Oh, yeah. I mean, for me, i glad I had a blessed, like, I can't complain. Now, my childhood was dope. I mean, I grew up basically... For the most part, girls didn't really was never a problem. For the most part, I would have, you know, my choice of, of girls. For the most part, I didn't really ever like pay to get in the club coming up or, you know, just little shit that I probably took for granted that, I mean, but how could you not if that's all you knew? If you never experienced anything else, like, it's like, hey, like, nah, we don't really do that. <laughs> like, you know? Well, I mean, you're living life. It was dope. I mean, like my high school years, my teen years. I mean, my whole that that shit set up the pavement for my life. It's like mm -hmm. to this day, people. I mean, we doing an interview right now. Yeah. Well, you do this first album, and for you, it was it was, it was big, but commercial wise, it didn't do huge numbers. No, it sold about one hundred fifty thousand copies, if I right. remember correctly. Which. Under today's standards would be huge, but back then everything's major label, yeah. everything's CDs. Well, back well, it's weird because see today's now they're not selling nothing, but at the time it was 
a good first album. Like it was because okay. at the time it was like you know you had groups like Gangstar who probably went gold on like the third or fourth album. So okay. they were a group that probably sold one hundred and fifty, then two eighty. Okay, so three six. So at the, the labels, time it was the decent. Still, the label is still fucking with you though. The, the label when Chris left, he took Violator to Def Jam. The label had the option, and the label opted to keep me. Okay. But the thing was, Chris was their rap guy, and Chris was my friend. Like, I didn't know none of them, really. So that's what happened with the second album. Right. That's why, I mean, the second album, we were actually recording. When we started recording it, Chris was still at Relativity with Violator. But by the time we finished, he wasn't. Because, like, the songs with Premiere, No Surrender, No Retreat, which you could, like, Google and hear... But like Chris set that up. I know that for a fact. Like the label, like that whole second album, even the joints I did with Claw Kent, everything was really on the strength of Chris. Mm -hmm. Chris or myself. It wasn't, they were like an alternative rock label. Like they had with Joe Satriani and they were they weren't hip hop. So mm -hmm. they didn't really know. They were that they were delving into the hip hop field. And Chris was their guy. So when he left, it was like left me kind of like out there and then my pops who was managing me he seen it as well if chris is out the picture we need to renegotiate because all his shit we should be splitting and they seen it as nah y'all wasn't getting it but he was like but y'all wasn't getting it either mm -hmm. so that shit turned into lawyer talk for two and three years and at the time i'm 17 18 and my friends is hustling and doing different things and i guess for a while i I delved into the streets and I kind of was like, I don't know if I was pissed off with music. I felt like I had a second album to put out because the first album, I was so young, you know, probably 60% of it was written by different native tongue members. Mm -hmm. um, so it had my input and me on it and my writing, but not as much. And I was older, like my voice changed. I'm, I'm, I had some shit to say now. Like right. when you fucking 12, you ain't really got much to talk about. Right. But you couldn't actually put out this album right. because it's we, wrapped up yeah, in lawyers. Like it's wrapped up with my dad who, and then it, it caused a lot of friction between me and my dad because... You know, at the time, I'm a young kid. I just want to rap, make videos, and be popping. But he's like, relax. <laughs> Let's get the paperwork straight. Okay, what ultimately happened? The album never came out? The album never came out. Um, you were dropped from the label? I mean, I guess at some point. I never really got a letter saying I was dropped. Right. Um, I guess, I don't know, maybe it just expired yeah. through time. I don't know. I don't, I okay. don't know. <laughs> That's an excellent question. <sighs> So but I know they Sony, which owned Relativity, still owns all of that music. So here you are, 17, 18 years old, and you had this run, which at one point you're realizing has ended. Right. Because you can't put music out. You're still contractually bound to this label, and everything's messed up. The album never came out. They never recouped, et cetera, et cetera. So then you get involved in the street shit. Right. Like, I mean, I don't feel like... I never like fully got involved. I mean, most of my friends was into the streets, so a lot of it was just guilty by association type okay. situation. Like, I mean, if you know your friends is if you chilling out on 145th and 7th Avenue and with four or five of your friends and three of them are selling crack, you kind of you not making money or selling crack, but if you see a cop, you like, yo, watch yourself, bro. You know what I'm saying? So. Now you're involved. Yeah, you're involved, but not involved, but involved yeah. enough. You know what I mean? Well, you started carrying guns at one point. Always had a fetish with guns. Okay. Um, one of Chris's main men, his right hand man, had got me my first gun. I guess probably right around the time when I first signed. So um, at 13, you had a gun. I was young. I might have. I mean, I probably signed when I actually signed when I was 14. So I was probably about 15. So you were 15 with a gun? Definitely, yeah. Uh, were you ever pulling it out during that time? No, never. Were you carrying it around? Uh, it would be in my car a lot. Um, in your car, but not, not on you? No, nah, never on my person. Okay. And this was an illegal gun? This wasn't purchased from a store, or registered, it was nothing? purchased from a man. Could have had a body on from it. From a man's in them. He <laughs> said it was new, though. It looked new, too. <laughs> yeah, okay. It looked new. It was in the box. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so... You're carrying around guns in your car, at the house. 
but you're not carrying it on you. Right. I mean, it, I mean, occasionally, I guess if I mean, I don't. It was so long ago, I guess. But like, if I was somewhere and not driving and going somewhere far, or or in a you know maybe going to see a girl in a neighborhood that I felt wasn't safe, I might have it on me going to a house or whatever. Okay. I mean, I don't really recall like that, but well, do you remember the first time you actually had to pull it out? Um. Uh, first time I pulled it, yeah. First time I ever pulled out a gun was I was down at South Street Seaport. <laughs> what happened? Um, I think it was me and my man Luther, Luther Burroughs, and we was out with these two young ladies. And I think well, you know we was on the pier. You know that's when the mall it's, it's ESPN now. It was shops and shit back then. Um, I think we were shopping and shit. You know, with the ladies, probably eating, getting ice cream, just chilling. But, and, and it was just a group of kids that this was, I don't know if they was just looking for trouble or, I think they were probably more looking for trouble because they, like, seen us with the girls. But I think me and him had went to the bathroom and when we came back, like, two of them was, like, trying to talk to the ladies. And you could see that they were, like, not, like, you know what I mean? You could see from their body language they were saying, like, we're good, dude. And... So I think we came and got them, and we was like, yo, let's get out of here. So as we're leaving, you we go downstairs um, on the pier shit, and they're still upstairs on the mall part, so they're talking shit. And I believe the gun was in the car. And um, so they're talking shit, and I'm like, what? I'm like, yeah, right, whatever. I, you know, probably said some hot shit back. So they're like, all right. So they come start coming downstairs. So I'm like, yeah, Lou, get in the car. Hit them in the car. So I think when we got to the car, I probably got it. And by the time, you know, they like turned the corner where, you know, we were part, you know how the cobbly streets are with the the brick stone, brick streets and shit. Shit, we was on one of them blocks and shit. And I just recall getting a gun and and like them niggas coming around the corner and like they kept approaching and as they got close, like just me firing at them. And it was like, (laughs) look back like, yo, like we was some retarded, like we used to do a lot of retarded, senseless shit. Like the shit was over nothing, anything could have happened. And my dad used to always tell me, if you gotta have a gun, keep it at home. He used to always say, the time it takes you to get home will maybe be the time you need to think about what you're doing and make a better decision. Okay, so you went and just shot at these dudes because they, they were they were approaching you in a an aggressive manner because i was retarded <laughs> i was like that's the only way to yeah. describe me vlad like yo black kids some of us is we got issues we have anger issues um we got pride issues we got patience issues and if it's not addressed we take it out on each other i don't understand why i don't know why like we take it out on each other all the time like it's sickening and sad well i mean in this situation you pulled out a gun you shot were you trying to hit him or were you just shooting there? I mean, I was a kid. I don't know. I mean, I was pointing at him, but okay, so I mean, it was a group, you, you, but I don't know that I was a, like I was. You know, okay, but you were you were yeah, you were shooting in their direction. Yeah, I definitely was. And shooting. they and they ran. They, yeah, obviously. of course. Yeah. So how did you feel after doing that for the first time ever? I know I was nervous. Like, let's get the fuck out of here. <laughs> but but afterwards, um, did you feel like a sense of power? Like, yeah, like. Next time this happens, I know, you know, I was, I, 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 I like was, this feeling, you know, or, or is I it was like- bugged. Like, I used to smoke a lot of weed. Like, I remember us being on the FDR going uptown and my man Lou, like, yo, you bugging, you bugging. And I just was laughing, like, yo, you're, bu- you're bugged too. Like, I was just bugged. Like, I used to smoke a lot of weed and just, like, my remedy to everything was roll up. Like, I didn't, okay. I was stupid. You know how we be, how we get in the club. Like, okay. So, so that, that situation happens. And do more shootings happen over time? Um, I want to say no. Like, no, nah, I don't think so. No. Okay, but you're still carrying a gun everywhere. Till I caught does my it, first gun case. D- does it, well, at one point, does it escalate from keeping the car to actually keeping it tucked in? Or no, I remember when I first got my, first caught my gun case, it was in the car. I think okay. it was in the glove compartment under the seat. So because you're carrying this gun around everywhere, you get pulled over one day. Cops check the car. They find this gun. Lock me up. Lock you up. Uh, and you just get probation the first time. 
Yeah, Bob Kalina, baby Chris Lighty, baby Chris got me a little hit. Robert Kalina, he does like all the hip hop <laughs> heads. Um, he got me probation. Okay, because you were facing what a couple of years maybe. At that time, the gun laws weren't like that. I mean, I was probably yeah. facing. I mean, maybe a year, but okay. You get off with probation. Probation was standard for you know your first arrest. You know, mm -hmm. back then, that wasn't like they gave me a crazy break. You know. Okay. But as you're on probation, you're still carrying around a gun. Not well, at still, first. Well, you still had a gun. Um, I mean, not actually. It's not that gun. They took that gun. Um, I mean, I think for a while, for a while, I probably chilled. Then eventually, you know, you get comfortable and forget what it was like that night in jail. And hmm. <laughs> that's why sometimes you might need to spend a little time in jail that first time, so you really get a dose. You know what I mean? Um, so you start carrying a gun again. Again. Then you get caught. <laughs> again. Or, However, I get when I get caught again, I'm trying to think what happened. When I get caught again, I'm like almost done with the probation. Like I'm getting ready to get like off a little early because I was out of trouble. And I just happen to have a cool ass probation officer who when I caught the case, I called her and she did some paperwork and like probably backdated or something to make mm -hmm. it seem like I got I was off. And that made me eligible to get probation again. But the second time I think I got probation, a, a five, a, a five, I think it was a six, five split. It's like three months house arrest, three months weekends on Rikers Island and five years probation. So I was eligible to get probation again through the extracurricular activities of my probation officer. Okay. So you're spending weekends in Rikers? Right. I had to do weekends at Rikers, and um, it what, was it was like I would go Saturday morning. Like some people had to go Friday night mm -hmm. till Sundays, but you know it's all how the judge mandated it. But my judge mandated it, like I had to be there like eight in the morning on Saturday morning, and I would get released Sunday afternoon. Okay, which isn't as bad as real real jail I mean, time, but it's still it's, not it, great. That's just retarded. I mean, Rikers Island isn't real jail time. That's jail. That's not prison. Yeah, it's exactly. real jail, but it's not prison. Okay. But you're actually getting a bigger dose this time. Now you actually have to go to Rikers and everything. Yeah, but like it that. was stupid. It's like, I mean, that shit was, like with the Saturday shit, by the time you get processed in, like on Saturdays, it's like dinner time. Hmm. So the time you eat and lay, get your bed and shit, next thing you know it's morning. And yeah, you're you, out. They packing you up to leave. That shit was retarded. <laughs> okay. So you get put on house arrest after that second gun charge. Yeah, I did the, the Rikers shit first, and then I did the house arrest. And at first you stayed with your parents. I think the whole time I stayed with my baby, my oldest daughter's mom. I think we were living together by then. Okay. I think when I knew I had to do it, that's when okay. I moved in with her. So so you go and move in with Vicky. Vicky, yeah. Um, well, at the time you guys didn't have any kids together. No, she had Mariah, who was probably around three. Okay. So you move in with this girl who has a three-year-old daughter. You guys are... You know, shacking up, shacking up, and she gets pregnant. Yep, <laughs> and she has a daughter. Yep. So now, the four of you are are at, you know at this house together, and I guess you're putting you know buying furniture. And we were in a one bedroom in the Bronx on yeah. Union Port, like right off White Plains Road, right down from Pelham Pelham Parkway and whatnot. Right. And I believe at some point when she was pregnant or maybe when she first had her baby, her brother had to go do six months on Rikers Island or had to do a year on Rikers Island, I think. And it was like, you know, the, it was the mom's apartment for years. So the rent was probably like $10, you know, one of them stupid shits. And the moms didn't want to lose the apartment, but she wasn't living there. She's like, I don't want to lose it, but I'm not staying there, so I'm not paying it. Okay. So, and it's two bedrooms. Y'all need space. You just had a baby, or if she was pregnant, get ready to have a baby. Why don't y'all take it? So we opted in. So you move into this two bedroom apartment, the four of you, with a new baby, and her brother Sean, who was locked up, gets out. Right. He got out. I guess you know probably a year later. I mean, uh, we were living there about a, probably a year, eight, a little eight months before he got out. So he gets out, and suddenly he's put in a situation where the house, the apartment he was living at, now has you and a baby 
and all the rooms are filled and he's sleeping on the couch. Everything. Yeah, he went from having his, that was his bachelor pad to him almost being <laughs> halfway out the door type shit. Okay. But by that time, it was like I was kind of established. I'm paying all the bills, and he's coming home, so he didn't really have much. Okay. So, you know. so how are you making money at this point? Because the music um, thing is long yeah, gone. The music thing is gone. At that point, I think I was selling weed, and I was working. My mom had got me a job with her at GHI, a health insurance company. Um, doing I was so I was doing that like that was I had a nine to five. Um, but it was it was smooth. Like it wasn't like no real strenuous work. Um, okay, and when you said selling weed, were you moving weight, or is it just nah, a little I mean, bit of? I mean, like I'd probably be buying a pound or two of weed, you know, and okay, you know, good amount, but weight. not not no kingpin type. Nah, nah, <laughs> you know, well, I feel, help pay my bills, you know. Okay. I have a little two, three girls, my, some of my baby mom's girlfriends, but they get their little ounces and shit, you know. Definitely not no kingpin shit, but okay, so you're making you know, extra. It was ghetto fabulous, <laughs> making extra couple thousand on the side from from selling weed, right? Something that's perfectly legal these days. Um, so the gun thing is still happening. You're still riding around with a gun and um, having guns around. By the time we move, I'm off the thing. No more gun. I ain't fucking with the guns right now. At all? No. I probably had a gun in the house that stayed in the house, I think. Okay. But which is still an illegal gun. Definitely. So you're still rolling the dice. Yeah, I mean, I had a fetish for guns, and it, like I knew it was coming. Like this is my word, right? like I always knew. Like, like why do motherfuckers carry guns? You know what I'm saying? Right. Like, like and it, you've gotten arrested for it two times. Yeah, like you have a newborn coming. daughter. It was coming. It was coming. Like, and you are still, like, this you are still saying, rolling the dice. People. But... That's why when I speak to like a lot of young kids, it's like it's sad. But sometimes when I speak, be speaking to some of these kids, it's like I'll be like, yo. You ain't you you ain't caught your bid yet. You still got a bid to do. And some people get offended or what you mean? Like you could just tell from the attitude the I was there, bro. Mm -hmm. And sometimes with 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 young black kids, it's like you could tell them till you blue in the face. They got to see it. They got to experience it. Right. My pops used to tell me, "You gonna have to go to jail." Right. I had to see it. So after going through these two arrests, doing weekends at Rikers and, you know, having to do house arrests and all this other bullshit, you're still risking your freedom and you still have this illegal gun at the house. So here you are in this two bedroom with your, you know, with your family, essentially. And Sean is back, back from jail. At what point did the, the tension between the two of you start? Um... I think I feel like it was always like a little tension because that was his apartment. That's his little sister. Like, I mean, his apartment, I'm fucking with his little sister. Then you know what I'm saying? I'm Chi Ali. So you know, I'm from co-op, they from Throgs and that, you know, different neighborhoods. So everybody, oh, man, fuck that Chi Ali nigga. You know, that was just that's just how it is, what it was growing up for me. It was always, fuck that shit. You know, niggas, that's just black, young black kid, male's disposition because I guess because, you know, girls like me. My image was with the little girls. You know what I'm saying? So everybody, not everybody, but the bulk of the boys' disposition was, fuck the Chi Ali nigga. Not because I did something, not because they disliked me really, just because. You're a little more famous than everybody yeah, else. Yeah, that's it. Okay. And at one point, I guess you lent him you lent him some money, or now when he first came home, I gave him some work, some weed. Like, I think I gave him some coke, some coke. I think I gave him some coke. Like, I mean, but were you selling coke yourself at the time? I feel like I wasn't, but I feel like like I had friends that would come to New York from different places and use me as a vessel to get what they needed, and I would get mines, and sometimes okay. they would make me bless me, like yo here. And you know, if they blessed me, I knew what to do with it. But that wasn't my my thing. Okay, so you had some coke, and you just said, said here, go yeah. go. Like make when some he money first with came that. home, I think I gave him like an ounce, like on some get on your feet shit, like here. Like my man gave it to me. Like I didn't really fuck with it like that. Okay. So like on some here, um, he gave him an ounce and he got it off. I mean, I don't know what he did with it. I didn't want nothing back from it. Right. He had just came home. Okay. Like, I don't know what he did with it. But then at one point, I guess 
you did let he owed you money or something. Yeah, like after that, like I'd give him more. Like I gave him coke after that. But after that, it was like, yo, give me what like what I paid or whatever you know number we negotiated. Like give, the first one was you just came home. You need clothes and drawers and get on your feet. The second one was like, all right, is we rocking and rolling or what? Okay. So he was rocking and rolling. So you were giving him coke and he was bringing back the money. You were fronting it to him. He was bringing it back. Whatever. I mean, um, he would bring it back, but we was living together too. So it was like, it might be in groceries. It might be different ways. Okay. We worked it out though. But did he start to fall behind on payments or? I don't feel like he fell behind on payments. I feel like I was out of town once. The first time we really got into it, I was in Atlanta for like a week or two. And him and his sister, like they, he was, he used to do little weird things. Like take the bulb out in the kitchen, like you know, my baby mother come home, be like, "Yo, I got home from work, I can't reach the shit," and you know, it's all dark in the house, and you know, she'll drink the girl's juice, like the juicy juice, like shit that's for the kid, like just little simple shit. So they would go through it, um, but me and him, like she kind of, oh, I feel like she always kind of kept it at bay, like what she would tell me, cause she knew. You know, she knew I was kind of a hothead, and he probably, you know, his disposition probably was, what the fuck the Chiali nigga? And so she probably tried to keep keep shit at bay, but it would just be sometimes so over the top that she would have to make mention of it or she would need me. Like, I remember when I was in Atlanta, she needed money for something. And like, that was the first time, like, I really asked him for bread that he owed me. Like, yo, give your sister some bread for me. And I believe like the first time he did it, I don't like it was a long time ago. I don't recall. You know what I'm saying? A lot of that shit is real sketchy right now. The uh, the, the, the the night of the altercation, him and um his sister had got into it and she called me crying. So when she called me, I was like, put him on the phone. Cause like previous to this, you know, we might have had one of two um, you know disagreements but never you know never nothing crazy never nothing disrespectful never out of pocket you know what i mean nothing where you would think it's anything so i guess when she put him on the phone i was like yo what's popping like yo what's good what's popping with you what's going on and his disposition was more or less on some what like you don't even live here no more because by then i had moved out i was living in harlem oh you moved out yeah so um you know, his disposition was just like on some real other shit. Like, you don't even live here no more. You can't tell me nothing about my sister. And I'm like, all right, but yo, like, she, I think she needed money for juice, for the milk, for the girls, like some stupid shit. And like, you know, and I'm like, yo, give us some money for some milk so I ain't got to come uptown. I'm in Harlem. Like, so I ain't got to come all the way to Throg's Neck for no 10 feet. I'm going to spend more money in the fucking cab. And he was like, on some, nah, I'm not giving a shit. And I was like, all right, well, give her the money you owe me. You know, like now my shit is changing. Like I'm going from what's going on, like y'all on some silly shit to like, all right, well, give her the bread you owe me. And he was on some, I'm like, I'm not giving you nothing. I'm not giving her nothing. You dead. Like everything is dub. Like I don't, he had just came home from jail. He was going through something. Um... And then, like in the in the papers and shit, like on TV, they had said CDs and shit. He had a bunch of CDs. I think when I moved out, we was doing like a housewarming. He was, I think, locked up. So when we was doing a housewarming, I was like, "Yo, I need some of these CDs for the party." My baby mother's like, "All right, take them, but just bring them back, cause you know how he is about his CDs. Like he was a collector." So I was like, "Cool." And I would have told him if he was home, and he would have gave him to me. Like, it wasn't like that. It was like maybe 7 AC. It wasn't nothing retarded. You know what I mean? So I guess that's where the, all the CD shit came from. But when me and him was talking, like, he never mentioned no CDs. That's why when all that shit came out, I'm like, that shit wasn't about no CDs or nothing like that. But anyway, we going back and forth, and at some point, he told me to suck his dick, and I was like, all right, well, you know, keep that energy. I'm going to come up there. Okay, and there's something about New Yorkers and the term, suck my dick. Because, <laughs> for example, I interviewed Fat Joe recently, 
Like this was like I don't know, six months ago. And he said, "I'm gonna be honest with you. If somebody told me suck my dick right now in in this hallway or something like that, I would stab him up or something right now. Like, I'm just being honest with you. I would really, really hurt this those guy. Those words are that serious to you? Yeah, those are serious to any real nigga. Like that's like the that's this. I don't know. That you might as well just put a death threat or something right in the card. I'm gonna kill you or something." This is multimillionaire Fat Joe with kids and a family and a career, and he would still risk his freedom over the term suck my dick. What is it about suck my dick that is so over the top for someone like yourself at the time? I mean, for me, it was I just recall my older brother when I was younger just telling me, yo, you don't let nobody invite you to their dick. And that's that. Like, he never said no more. But he said that, and he said it in a way when I was young that probably was more a little more stern than what he said most things, because I knew that was a no-no. So you're arguing with him over the phone, and he says, suck my dick. <laughs> but you're uptown right now. You're in Harlem, yeah, and they're in, and they're in the Bronx. They're in the Bronx, man. I'm on 34th and 8th. How did that phone call end? Um... He said, suck my dick. I'm not giving you nothing. You can suck my dick. And I was like, keep that energy when I get up there. Okay. So you're at your house in Harlem, and you get off the phone. What are the next steps that happened then? Um, I was sick. I think one of my mans had just came and took my car. I called him. Boom. Yo, come get me. He like he probably was going to free go off with the chick or something. So he like, well, come on, man. I just left type shit. I'm like, bro, come get me, homie. You know what I'm saying? I'm telling my man, come get me. Um, he comes and gets me. We ride out. Well, you go and grab your gun first. Okay. Why did you decide? to take your gun with you as you're going to see your baby mother's brother? I was tight, like we was beefing on the phone. Like we, like I, by, at some point it got crazy. And then with him telling me to suck his dick and all that, like I was like, I was going up there to pop him. That's what I told my man in the car, like yo, my man was like, I'm gonna fuck the nigga up, hold me down. Cause you know, like we go on today projects, hold me down, don't let nobody jump me. I'm like, I'm gonna pop this nigga. He like, nah, you gonna gotta do it. Listen, I told my man what I was gonna do. Straight up and down. Like I told him what I was gonna do. Like you don't like a lot of it was we lived together. Like we never dealt with we never played disrespect. Like we never done that. But this is your baby mother's brother. Right. That's my and that's the principle of it. This is the, not this is like, not just some random stranger. Yo, you Vlad, don't know like, who they it, are. Right? When you did twelve years and you look back. Big picture, like I look yeah. at principles, like some people look at, but the principles, nigga said suck his dick. But the principle too is that was your baby mother's brother, bro. Right. You Which know is what I'm more saying? important than, than it any, any been, words. It should have been, right. Um, also like with her calling me, like I don't think she called me thinking this nigga's gonna come up here and kill my brother. You know what I'm saying? I don't think she thought that. You know what I'm saying? So, of course, the principles of the situation, it, 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 the principles be fucked up. But at the same time, it's like you got to honor somebody that got those morals and principles because when it stands in your favor, when it's not like in one of these stupid situations, you'll respect it. You know what I mean? It's like, yo, everybody will say, oh, you see something, say something. You see a woman getting raped. Yeah, I'm a helper. If the nigga turn around and shoot me, they're going to, he should have minded his business. Like motherfuckers is just like that. Yeah. That's how it's I, I gonna understand. be. So so here you are in the car with your gun on you, your legal gun on you, ready to kill. I mean, I don't know that I was ready to kill. I was ready to shoot. You're ready to shoot. And killing happens when you shoot. So. Exactly. Consciously, I was definitely ready to shoot. Subconsciously, right. I probably was ready to kill. And and your man is actually going along with this and driving you to the location. Even but though he's he, trying to, he's to, driving like, "Yo, I'm gonna fuck this nigga up." Like that's what he's saying. He's talking the same time I'm talking. You know what I'm saying? Because I'm not really talking. I'm just like, "Listen, I said it once what I was gonna do, and I wasn't really saying nothing. I was just like waiting to get up there." Okay. So he takes you to the Bronx. 
Do you go to the apartment first or do you go Yeah, on the I street? went to the apartment first and he wasn't in there. Okay. I just remember like being in a crazy rage because like I think the apartment I, was all fucked up, right? Yeah, when I got there, my mom's was there. She was downstairs, her, my baby mother, the kids, everybody was downstairs outside. So they like, they trying to calm me down. They like trying to calm me down. They telling my man, they trying to get my man, like get him. But my man is like, he really can't get me. Like, I got the gun. Like, <laughs> the fuck? Um, I go in the apartment, the apartment is like ramshack. Like homie done ramshack the apartment. So I'm like, now I really get mad cause I'm like, the shit fucked up. And I'm like, he going? I'm like, oh, he was popping all this shit. He going, like, I don't know what happened. But when that apartment led, yo, like something happened to me, bro. Like something happened. Like I just blacked out. I blacked out. Like I, like I just went into a rage. Like word. Oh, this nigga told me something. And he not here. Like the audacity of like I don't like I bugged out, bro. I black. I blank. Okay. So you left the apartment. Left the apartment. Cut through the projects. Cause if you know Throgs Neck, do we have is the strip with the little store. Like it's one. You know, at night there's one store where everybody hang out at on the app. So I'm going to the Ave. When I get to the Ave, I see him. Um, get to the Ave, I see him. When I see him, he's talking to a man in the car. Man's the car's double parked in front of the store. The man's in the driver's seat. He's outside talking to the man in the driver's seat. When I see him, I call him. When he turn around. I back out. I'm like, yo, what up? And I back out. He like, what, nigga? Like, like I'm supposed to be scared type shit. So when you see him, you pull out your gun. When I see him, I call him. You call him for when you say backed out. What does that mean exactly? I, when I see him, I call him. Yeah. When I call him, he turns around. That's when I backed out. Pulls out the, the gun. Got it. I back out. He says some hot shit like, like what? Like, nigga. So I'm like. I mean, do you think that at the time, if he was like, oh, okay, hey, oh, okay, never mind. Like, I have no clue, like, you, I don't know. You were just in a I was, I was black. Like, he might have, it might have been, I don't know. Okay. I don't know. But he's basically. But him doing that definitely didn't help the situation. Right, so he's escalating it as well. He's saying, I don't care that you have a gun. He definitely was on it like that. And at that moment, I think. That's when I just started hitting. And you, I guess you empty the clip. I don't know. I know I hit him. Multiple times. Yeah. Because, I, you know, I guess in the documentary you said how you saw he was, he had like a, a, a fluffy jacket on and like you could see the feathers or, or whatever. So you shoot him multiple times and your man is right there with you or no? Yeah, he's right there with me. Okay. So you guys run. Do you know that you killed him or no idea? I just know I shot him. You shot him. And my man, we in the car, my man's driving like, yo, you bugging. Like, yo, you dumbed out. Like, you dumbed out. You bugging, you bugging. And I remember getting rid of the gun on my way back downtown. Um, I think we were somewhere on the east side. We went to the east side. I was in my man's barber shop. That's when we got the call that like he had died. Who called you? Joey. My man Joey Kane, rest in peace. Um, Joey was one of my brother's mans. He was a little older than me from back in the days, who baby moms was from Throgs Neck, so he used to hustle up there. But he was actually from the Polo Grounds. But he was like a, a, a big brother to me, too. Um, so he knew him, and then like I said, my moms and my baby mother was out there when the shit happened. So like all of them, everybody went to the hospital. So he was there and allegedly, um, from what he had told me, when the police got to the hospital, they was questioning my baby mother and she was lying to them. Like she was straight up and down. Like, like it wasn't, it was, I think she said it was two white guys in a white truck or some crazy shit. Like, and, um, the person who was in the driver's seat, who he was talking to, was at the hospital. His car had got shot up a little bit, but he wasn't hitting nothing. But when she said that, 
as story has it, he was like, nah, Vic, you know that was your baby father that did that. As soon as he said that, the D's, and man, let me, we need to talk to you. And so from that night, I knew he was dead. I knew who was telling on me. All of that, like I knew all of that. You know, all this is happening. The sh- when the shooting happens, your adrenaline is on 150. But as you're driving, you know, you're driving away, you go to the barber shop, you're getting the phone call, your adrenaline is going down and down and down and down. And the reality and the severity of the situation is starting to hit you. It didn't really hit me yet. No? Even when you got the phone call that he was dead? It ain't... I mean, I guess when I got the call, it hit me, but it didn't really hit me. I didn't really know. I didn't know what jail was. I didn't know. Like, I didn't know. I didn't have a clue what I did, man. I didn't have a clue what I did to my life, bro. Like, I didn't understand. I mean, but you do know at this point you have a murder on you. Yeah, I know that. It was in a public place. There are, I know there that. I remember when we left the barbershop, we went to one of my man's house in Jefferson Projects, in Johnson Projects on 115th and Lex. We up there, my man Joey was there that called us from the hospital. Him and his wife was there. Um, My dude whose apartment I was at and his wife and two of my mans. And I remember my man's wife like, yo, you should turn yourself in. The other chick and man was like, word, you should turn yourself in. The dude that drove me was like, word, you should think about it. And then the other dude I was with, I remember him like, yo, I need to holler at you, yo. And we left in my car. That was my man, Lord C. And, um, you know, he raised me. And Lord, and that ride, the car ride, like he cried. That nigga was like, bro, I don't know what the fuck all them people talking about, your brother and all that. But don't turn yourself in, bro. He was like, yo, you don't get no bonus points for that. They don't subtract time for that. Mm-hmm. Like, homie, nah. He was like, bro, I can't let you do that. Like, you're not doing that with me. Like, he was literally crying. Like, you're talking about like a, a G, an older nigga that raised me, you know what I'm saying? Literally crying, like, yo, I can't let you do that. And he took me on the run. I was living with him like my first six, seven months on the run with him and his girl. So you left New York with him? I left New York. Like you went day. to we, Atlanta? We went to, yeah, we went to Atlanta. Okay. And, you know, in the documentary, you kind of break this down, but there's this whole process. I mean, the documentary, like my book, for those that don't know, I got an autobiography I wrote. My book breaks a lot of it down way more. The documentary is more, it's my life, but it's more on the music. Yeah. Where the book is more on my life, my life, everything from everything. Okay. But, like, don't, like, let me say this, though, like, I want to send my condolences to Sean Raymond and to his family, to his son, man. Like, with this shit that just happened in Nipsey, like, it's just so much going on in my mind right now. Like, I was a kid that was just irrational and retarded and making stupid decisions based on emotions, but I see it so much with young black kids. It's like, yo, if you don't listen to nothing I say, like, yo, check your emotions, bro. Think about what you do before it's too late because 20 seconds, 30 seconds changed my life forever. And a suck my dick, like, even on the principle, a suck my dick ain't worth 12, 13 years. Right, because Sean had a son. A baby at the time? Nah, little Sean, like little Sean, his son was my man. Like little Sean was like 12, 11, 12 years old. At the time? Yeah, like 10, 11. He wasn't no baby. Like right. I used to have, right, watch him. You used to babysit him? Yeah, like he was, not he was like a big kid. Like, yeah. he was a cool kid. Like, like yo, I just want to send my condolences. Like, I don't, it's nothing you could say. Like I did the ultimate because you can't give life back. You know what I'm saying? And it was, it was not warranted because my life, where well, he wasn't coming to gun me down. He wasn't like, it right. was just I was I was an idiot, bro. Like I was a hothead. Like it's nothing else I could say. Like I, I fucked up. I made a bad decision, and it shit cost me. And it's like now it's about rectifying it, though. It's about 
how we got to keep some of these other young motherfuckers from doing the same stupid shit because it's senseless and it's pointless and it's just a waste of time and it ain't about being tough or nothing. It's just about being smarter than to let some words control you. Like if somebody else can verbally control your actions through their words, then you're weak and you got issues and you're gonna have issues forever because you can't control the mother what another motherfucker say. And if Vlad, if you, even if you could say you dumb nigga, motherfucker, if that can make me just bang, 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 then I'm weak, bro. Like, I got to be smarter than that. Yeah, no, we, we've talked about this, how, you know, the, the N-word said in a, in a racist manner will make most black people react. You see what I'm saying? Where there's really no equivalent yeah, like the to end, that. Like a white person saying the N-word is kind of yeah. like a suck my dick from any, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you see what I'm saying? <laughs> but the fact that these words could have such an automatic reaction. I think it's just a trained behavior, like something that's been put in us, I guess, through society or our upbringing, mm. that probably more our upbringing, I guess both, Um, that it's a learned behavior that we haven't grasped how to escape yet. It's like, I did 12 years. I know better, I'm sharp. It's times on Instagram I fall into, you know what I'm saying? Getting back and forth with motherfuckers <laughs> where I be like, but now the funny part, like when I'm on Instagram, like I don't really, like, like you know me and Mice is cool and he gotta be more politically correct. And like he gets death threats and all type of shit where yeah, I'm me not too. really with that. Me like too. I'm like, like, and my shit is, man, listen, like, I'm not going back and forth on social media. Like, I kind of try to fall back from that shit. You're now on the run for a murder. And, murder. and your man takes you down south to Atlanta, and you're living with him at this point? I'm living with him and his girl for about five, six months. Okay. Then I end up getting an apartment on my own. And you talked about this whole process where... You know, if you can't use your real name, you, I guess, get a, a fake birth certificate and then get Yeah, a what happened was, I'm saying, we like, we had it hooked up. I forget exactly how we did it. I know we had a chick who worked at a hospital who used to get the birth certificates with the seal on them from the hospital, but it would be blank, like no name. So she would sell them shit. So we would get the births, go anywhere, type in the name. Type in your name, whatever you want your name to be. Now you got a birth certificate. Boom, official birth. Then um, I got a social. I think my man had took, he had got like one of his little bitches, he had took her son's social security card. So I think he gave me that first. So I had the social and then when I got the, um, the birth certificate, I typed in the name on the social. So boom, now I got a social and the birth. Then, um. I needed like a proof of address. I went to like a housing development and got a lease. Took the lease to the library, typed in all the information like I lived there. When I went to motor vehicles, I got proof of address from the lease. Mm -hmm. I got birth and I had my social. So now you're a whole new person I went, on papers. <laughs> I went and took my written test and had a permit and in Atlanta, you could do the road test the same day. I had a license the same day. So now I got a license, birth, social security. Social. Then I started filling out credit cards with the shit. Started getting credit cards, like, <laughs> like I was tearing like shorty that. shit up. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Well, but then, but then you went to a gun store and got a gun. Legally. Legally. Now, legally was that your first legal gun? gun? I mean, that was not exactly legal, but. <laughs> yo, I went. And it, you know how it is down south. Boom. I went, gave my ID. I was nervous as fuck. That nigga ran my shit. He said, yep, you're good. You get as many as you want today. <laughs> so now you got a gun. Okay. But even with all this paperwork, you're still wanted for murder in New York. That's a fact. Did you find out officially I mean, that you were being charged or... When they told me that he died, I left. So it was like never like I was under arrest and on the run. I just left. Like I, I looking for who? I, I never spoke to them for them to say they was looking for me. Okay, but you you're <laughs> assuming that you're wanted for murder. Mm -hmm. So you're living down south with this new identity, but you're still Chiali in the face. 
Yeah, but I was, you know, I was letting my, I looked like you a little bit. I looked yeah. like I had the Vlad beard. You had the beard, and, you had your dreads. Yeah, I had, it was braids, but when, like, if I would take my braids out, my head was so full. If I wore a Rasta hat, it looked like it was filled with dreads. Like, Got it. And then with my, like, I looked like a Rasta, for real. I used to look like okay. a little Rasta kid. <laughs> well, but you can't really go and get a, a nine to five job. It's too risky. Definitely. I wasn't doing that. You weren't doing that. So, and you couldn't sit on the corner and sell weed or crack because if the police picked you up and ran your fingerprints, you're going to jail forever. Fact. So you had to rob drug dealers. I had to do every night. I mean, it was whatever. It was everything goes. It was, you know, we was selling weed. We might be selling coke. We might be selling some fake coke. We might pull a jokes. We might. It was, you know, I'm on the run for a homicide. It don't matter. At that point, like, my thinking was, it really don't matter. Like, nothing's going to top that one. So what do the fuck do it matter? And you got to eat. What could I, you know, what could I do? But, like, my man, Lord, he was, like, a mastermind. Like, he one of them dudes that got towns all up and down the East Coast where, you know, we would go, you know, with Coke or weed or whatever. And, you know, we was functioning, you know. What was the worst thing you had to do during that time? I mean, I feel like the worst thing I had to do was rob. So you're robbing people, Rob, like armed robberies, armed robberies, just shootings. You know, people getting hit. You don't know what happens, like shit like that. Like I was reckless, like I, like that on the run. Like I was just like a savage. Like, and I guess thinking you getting twenty five to life is kind of like you like fuck it. Like, I guess a part of me was like. I'm not going to jail. Like, they're going to give me 25 years. Like, I'm a dope caught in the street. I mean, I didn't know. I was a young kid. I probably was half scared, half adrenaline filled. You know what I mean? Like, I don't know. Like, any situation, I don't know how I'll react. I just remember, like, like before situations would happen, like, if we going to roll, like, if I'm with my man, he like, yo, what's up? Like, if I make up my mind that that's what we going to do, like, like, I just get that build up. And then it's just like, and then it's no turning back. Okay. But you were actually shooting people during the robberies and so forth? I'm they... saying we was doing, Vlad, it was crazy. It was like, crazy. But like, it was crazy. When I was on the run, like, that's probably the most unproud year of my life. Like, although, like, what I did was a mistake. But when I was on the run, like, that was a lifestyle. Well, I guess, yeah. I mean, if you kill somebody, you already have one murder on you. If they catch you with double murder, what are they going to do? Give you double life? I get, I, I can I mean, see how that. Yeah, they can actually. I mean, they like, can, but what what difference does it make? I mean, it I'm actually saying. makes a difference because shit. Sometimes that be the difference from motherfuckers saying, "Yo, take this fifteen years," versus you going to trial and if you blow, you getting thirty two to life or some retarded shit. Okay. You know, so it do make a difference. Okay. It, but you don't see it. At the time, you can't see right. it. At the time, you just didn't give a fuck. You were living completely well, outside the law, taking whatever money you could take from people and and just surviving. Mm -hmm. And well, not for the most part, hustling. Like, just we, hustling. we cope. For the most part, hustling. Okay. Like, I never really was a stick-up kid. That never was my thing. What happened to make you leave Atlanta and go back to New York? America's most wanted. Okay, so then the TV show ran. My baby mother told me. She called me and told me they were airing it. I forget what date. Whatever date it was, she was like, yo, you know they putting you on that show. I was like, I heard you. So I was living at my development in Atlanta for a while by then. So we thought it best to leave. Because now your face is all over national television. Right. And I guess they ran it twice, right? There's two episodes yeah, they ran on it. Um, I remember the first time they ran it was November of November of 2000. They ran it in November of 2000. And then they ran it again in like February of 2001. Okay. Do you think if they didn't run that show, you'd still be living under the radar somewhere? Uh-uh. No. Okay. I well, think I would have ran a lot longer though. Did you ever consider leaving the country? Like going to a place with like no extradition or I did. Cuba. Cuba. There you go. Cuba would have probably no, kept my you. dad my dad actually had ties with, you know, some of the black liberation army guys and he was like, Let me know, I'll make the calls. But 
I felt like, yo, I got to have some money. Like, I don't know nobody. Like, I felt like if I'm going to Cuba, I want like 30, 40 bands at least. You know what I mean? Whereas, you know, like that's just different. You don't know the language. You just oh, yeah. stuck. I mean, Asada Shakur is over there still. Yeah, you know? Yeah. That would have been something. So, <laughs> they ran America's Most Wanted, and now you got to move out of this, this housing uh, facility. Yeah. So you start going back to New York, where you're York, actually I mean, wanted. New York, Philly, Jersey, all over. Okay. But yeah, I think by that time, I think when I started frequenting New York more, I think subconsciously I was getting tired. I think that was kind of me because I knew stay the fuck out of New York. So I feel like that was me kind of giving up. Like you, you were just tired. Up. You'd been on the run for how long? Like uh, 16, 17 months, some shit like that. Okay, about a year and a half. Um, I was tired. Like it was a lot with my mom's. Like that shit was killing my family. Um, that shit is a lot. Like people don't understand that shit is a lot. Um, I'm just fucked up thinking about Nipsey, bro. I guess you got me a little. Yeah, and we'll, and we'll we'll talk about that at at the end because I think that's important as well. Yeah. So then, March fifth, two thousand one. You're you're hanging out in New York. No, oh, I'm asleep in New York, like four in the morning. They kicked the door and kick in the door, waving the full full, and it was over. Yeah, and I guess uh America's Most Wanted did like a follow up video and uh, you know, you had the song uh Roadrunner. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, they said the Roadrunner isn't running anymore. Yeah. <laughs> and they showed you getting you know uh, you know, getting hauled off in handcuffs. Did you ever meet any of the America's Most Wanted guys or anything later on? No. no <laughs> How do you feel about John Walsh? Um, I feel fuck him. That's what I feel. Number one. I mean, I feel bad for whatever happened to his son. Nothing to do with my feeling towards him. Yeah. But just, I just feel like that whole America Most Wanted. It paints a picture before anything is known, and it's, it, I mean, how can you really get a fair trial after you've been on America's Most Wanted? Everybody assumes you're guilty. That's why they put you on it, to flush you out. You know what I'm saying? Which is basically what happened. Kind of so. I mean, I feel like I kind of gave up. Like, me coming to New York, I was giving up, bro. Like, they didn't flush me out. I mean, like, I had, if I wanted, like, I mean, I had places and towns in South Carolina where I probably could have still been on a run, but... I just would have been <laughs> milking cows for a living, you know what I mean? Right. Well, you get arrested, and then you get charged with what exactly? Uh, I mean, at first I was charged with murder in the second, like two counts of murder in the second, you know, criminal possession of weapons, okay. um, all type of shit. And but that, back before before we finish with, with America's Most Funny thing, like sometimes they depict people, they depict everybody as guilty when you don't know, ain't it innocent until proven guilty? Well, how the fuck you saying I did all this shit? I ain't even been captured yet. Mm. So you telling the people I did all of this. That's true. Could have been so someone how, else. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't, I don't get that. And then with my Good shit, point. I just And, and like, they're doing reenactments and everything. Yeah, like, yeah. and you getting stories from different people that, I mean, I guess sometimes can be valid and sometimes isn't. I mean, like in my case, they situate the, the story really wasn't valid. But, but um, just in my case with the witnesses, like if they interviewed fifteen people from apartments and that was on the scene, whatever, like they had fourteen different stories. Some it was four guys, one guy, two guy, three guy, car, back of the car, white Lexus on foot. Like that shit was so crazy, like. It was just wow, man. Well, you get arrested and you get charged and they put you on Rikers. And this is not the weekend Rikers. This is, this is full, full blown time. full blown Rikers. No bail. Right. No bail. <laughs> what was the worst part of that? Oh uh, Rikers is a very is a very notorious prison. I mean, they're saying they're gonna finally close Rikers because of just yeah, all the heard. You know, all the horrific things that have happened over um, the years. Was it, Rikers wasn't bad for me. Like, Rikers, I was young, Vlad. I was young and fighting the homicide. I just came off America's Most Wanted. Niggas loved me. <laughs> you are like a hero now. Uh, yeah, nigga. I was, geez, I was a legend. 
And I used to have weed, like all oh, my little girlfriends used to bring me weed. I was a little like the hell and I was good. Like not like I'm not and I'm not saying it like I was I was a legend on motherfuckers love me, not on no super tough shit. Yeah. I didn't really have to be tough. Nobody bothered me. I'm laid back. I ain't fuck with nobody. I used to smoke my weed. I mean, definitely had situations, but But you're still like three that. years day after day. You know, I mean, the le- monotony, legend or not, you're still in a fucking cage. Yeah, I mean, the day. monotony of it and not knowing what your future is going to be probably was the worst part. But at the time, like I was on a run so long, I knew I was going to jail. You know what I'm saying? I knew. So I was mentally prepping myself. So by the time I got to Rikers, my attitude was like they was offering me like 22 to life. I was like, I'm going to trial. I'm going to beat these niggas. So that shit was like... High school, we used to be running around the hallways looking for weed. But the right. attitude was, I'm gonna beat the. I'm not doing 22 years. Okay, I'm gonna but beat them. You're broke. At this no, time. I mean, I had like I'm not broke. I was locked up. No, no, but I'm saying you don't have a hundred thousand for for nah, lawyer money but, or whatever else. But like my parents had been when I was on the run. My mom and dad had paid my lawyer already. Like I had a lawyer. He was paid. We just had to give him more bread if we did, opted to go to trial. Got it. So um, your parents were putting up the money. They, they had, have to my put up dad, the house or whatever else. Nah, my mom and dad. I know. By the time I was captured, the lawyer was situated. Okay, so um, you're in a good situation. Leave and then me. when I was locked up. Like I think I might have had like six, seven thousand dollars on me when they locked me up. So like I was all right for a while, and then I had a bunch of girlfriends that loved me. Okay. So <laughs> like, it you, wasn't really the money. I don't think you're going back and forth with the prosecutors, and you finally settle on fourteen years. Right. Fourteen year plea deal. Uh, had you gone to trial, what was going to be the worst case scenario? Twenty five to click. Twenty five to life. So 14 years is looking pretty attractive right now at the time. No. It was not. I don't know. Because you're how old? Like 23, 24. 14 years was looking like I got, you do 12, I got three. It was looking like I got nine years to do. Y'all niggas is bugging. <laughs> like Axel or Jim Duggan. Like I couldn't see the end. I was like, I told a lawyer and my brother, nigga, y'all do that shit. If it's, y'all talking about take that shit, you come take that shit, nigga. Fuck out of here. Like, my brother, yo, we got you. You know you good. I got you. Man, listen, fuck out of here. <laughs> but you finally took it. Yeah, I finally took it. <laughs> just broke down, just like, okay, I can't. I'm saying, it was a few things. My mom's had motherfuckers coming to visit me and just you know my mom my mom's pressured me she pressured I remember she came to see me she cried she said she cried like and I begged I was like mommy please don't do that like let me make my decision you know what I'm saying based on me but she cried she begged me she said please don't go to trial like I know I could do 14 years like I'll see you free again she was like, I might never see you free again if you go to trial and lose. But, I mean, but, but she was blinded by, she knew I'd done the damn thing. So I'm looking at it like, yo, that got nothing to do in court. You know what I mean? Gotta prove it. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? But she looking at it like, you can't win, baby. Like, don't, like, she looking at it like, what's wrong with you? Like, how you think about trial? You know you spanked the boy. Like, how could you think about it? I mean, when you look at it now, with a level head and you look at the trial, you know, you look at the evidence, you look at the witness, the whole situation. If you had gone to trial, do you think you could have beaten it or do you think they would have found you guilty? I think I would have beat it. Really? I swear I do. Okay. I think I would have beat it. So you feel you you took the wrong move by taking the plea deal? I didn't say that. Okay. But you still think you could have beaten it? I think I would have beat him. Okay. But that's where my energy was. I was facing 20, like my energy was, I'm going to beat them. And I was going to beat them, Vlad. That's my word. I was going to beat them niggas, man. Them niggas okay. had one, but the boy in the car was the only person there saying no me. There was no cameras. There was no they other had the witnesses. The boy in the car was the only person saying me, bro. Got it. That was the only person saying it was me. Okay. Like, that's how I looked at it. But I was insane, bro. Like, that's what I'm saying, young black boys. We got issues, bro. We got anger issues. We are insane, brother. I'm trying to tell you, Vlad, I had issues. I still got issues. But I don't know what's wrong with us, bro. But we got to figure it out, man.
So then you start your time. 12 years. During that time, you get in trouble. You get put in solitary confinement. What was the longest solitary you had to do? I think 90 days. Three months. That's not a long time. Man. I mean, I mean, that's a long fucking com- time. Comparatively. That's a long time, but in jail, that's like, oh, you got 90 days. I mean, what you crying about? But yeah, but to a typical human <laughs> being that's not used to Nah, being, to me, nigga, that's why I never really went back to the box. <laughs> right. You can't even read in there. You nah, know. you could read. That's oh, all you, you could do is read. Okay, but that's it. My nigga, I read magazines from cover to cover, like the fine print, the stupid <laughs> shit. Like, especially when you first get there, you don't have, before you get your property. Well, when you talk about prison, you talk about a lot of violence. You yourself, were you involved in any? Or? I got stabbed on Rikers Island. You got stabbed? Right. Over what? Some blood crip shit. Okay. C gutter. C gutter, what up, nigga? <laughs> Nigga, see, you got a biggie cousin. Oh, really? Junior Mafia. See, you got a. See, you got a. Where you at? No, that's my man. Oh, okay. I got stabbed because of him. Oh, because of him? Yeah, because of him. I mean, that's my bro. That was my bro. You know, but he was, he's a he's a crip. Okay. And he's a, um, at the time, he was like a notorious crip. Like, he's a warrior. Like, see, when, when I was on Rikers Island and in prison, it was predominantly blood. So, those that was in the system at that time, that were Crip and claiming Crip, most of them was pretty tough. Most Because most of the Crips would turn Muslim or turn blood or just drop their flag or be Rasta. The Crips that stayed Crip and claim, most of them was tough. Like Hollywood, C. Gutter. C. Gutter was a warrior. Warrior. So he got into an altercation with some bloods? He got into an altercation with some bloods, and because me and him was cool, when the altercation happened, I think they moved him out to a different building, and because me and him was cool, they got at me. So he stabbed you? Yeah. Where? Chest. Badly? No. Okay. Scratch. <laughs> it was like a he burnt foul down a plastic toothbrush. Okay. Like the kid, me and the kid was crazy cool. That's what was wild, bro. That's why I was mad, bitch ass nigga. Cause we was cool, yo. He was a Bronx nigga too. He was just a blood nigga. And they was like, nigga, if you don't do it, you a plate. So that nigga was like, shit, it's me or him. I guess he figured, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but I was just like, that's why I can't get with that gang shit. Cause that's whack. Like if a motherfucker could just tell you to flip on your man. Uh, so so he had to stab a friend because the other blood stopped. I mean, we wasn't friends, but, but, so but he was we cool wasn't enemies. We wasn't en- We definitely wasn't enemies. Okay. You know, you talk about you always hear about rapes in prison and so forth. No. Never saw none of that. I'm saying it's mental rapes. Like it's not in the I guess you know in the seventies, probably early eighties, probably, but when I was in jail, most of the homosexuality is, is consensual. Um now you'll see, you know, young kids come in and old timers that be buoy bandits, you know, playing them close or helping them out. You know what it is. And you know, but it ain't really like too much. <clears throat> Give it here. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It ain't really. I never. Seen it's, it. it's not American me. Yeah, nah. Okay. Nah, it ain't too much. Well, that. you end up actually getting married. Yeah. In prison. I did. And then you got your wife pregnant. In prison. While still in prison on, on, on conjugal, conjugal visit. visits. Yeah. And in in Sing Sing. And sings, yeah, and sings, sings. So you guys had a ceremony inside the prison walls. I mean, a short ceremony, if you want to call it that. <laughs> and then what? There was like a room in the back that y'all could come and. I mean, the room is where the ceremony takes place, and then after you go on a regular <laughs> visit, you know, and then you wait to get your conjugal visits. And the conjugal visit, I'm saying, it's like a, a room, like a. Uh, the conjugal room. visit is basically like a two bedroom, like hotel or Airbnb. Outside the prison. It's on prison grounds, but outside oh. the prison. Ah, okay. So there's like it's a little cottage. Okay. They got fenced in <laughs> with like six little homes, like you know the little trailer homes. Okay. It's like two here, two here. Which two is there. better than where you were. The I mean, it's day, like yeah. you in the Airbnb. It's like you know you get your silverware, you got a stove, oven. Your people's okay. got to bring all the food. And, and, and how often do you get these visits? Depending where you at, like. Something like Attica, them shits is every 28 days, but Attica is 11 hours away, nine hours away. That's why a lot of people's family can't come. But like if your family could get to Attica and your wife could come on a weekday, you'll be out every 20 something days. Okay, and that's but, a lot. 
Hell yes, once a month. Okay, that's, I mean, excellent. Other places, what once some, every few the, months, like six once every six months. Damn. Because some jails, the list is backed up. If they only got six trailers and they got fucking mad motherfuckers getting married, <laughs> sometimes the, the list is backed up. It could be six months. I think Fishkill was like every ninety days. You know, it depends. Well, I uh, the other day I, I just went through all my interviews. And looked at all the people I've interviewed that have killed somebody. So, you know, including you, you know, who've spoken to me about the, the murder on, on camera or, or over the phone because they were in prison. I mean, apart from you, there's Ben J from the New Boys, No Plug, who killed Bankroll Fresh, uh, Shaka Sangor, who's a writer. Um, you know, Cassidy was arrested, you know, something to do with, uh, with somebody getting killed. Um, X-rated, a rapper from the Bay, you know, from Sacramento that was involved in a, in a home invasion murder. Uh, you know, Snoop, Felicia Pearson, you know, the girl who ended up being on Love and Hip Hop later on, who ended up killing a girl with a bat. Um, you you know, never interviewed Snoop, though. I interviewed Snoop, but not about. Yeah, but like people forget he, he, that he, Snoop was involved in a murder. Exactly, that's he another beat person. He beat it. He you beat know it. What I'm saying? He, he beat, beat it. It was self defense. He beat a homicide. Um, you know, the baby. Uh, kill somebody in self defense. I mean, allegedly. You know, Who? The baby. It's an artist from North Carolina. Okay. It was a Walmart situation. Somebody had rolled up on him and his family with a gun, and he he killed him in self defense. Um, you know, as well as G Depp. Uh, you know, who's in jail right now. Um, G Depp is crazy. Big Lurch. Uh, G Depp is crazy. Yo. <laughs> G Depp is all the way crazy. Yeah, Mac Minister as well. You know, these were over the phone interviews. A lot of people. And the stories are very different, you know. the The situations are all are all extremely different. I mean, my shit is. I don't know. Everybody think jail is justice. I don't feel that way. Like justice got to come from within. Like jail is all boy camp. Hmm. It's niggas that live good in jail. It's niggas getting trailers once a month in jail, yeah. <laughs> getting pussy and eat good and. Talk on the phone all day, like yeah. take pay bills and yeah. But stuff. all those people would rather be out. Some would rather be out. Most you would think they would rather be out, but you got motherfuckers that do shit to keep them in. So yeah. you got to question that. You know, as someone who's who's committed a murder, what would be a situation that you would have to be put in to do that again? That's my children. Protect your kids. Protecting my kids that is the only situation where I can say off the rip, I'm gonna be like, oh, I'm going to get you. But um, I mean, other than that, but then, yo, Vlad, like I try to talk to niggas, right? And it's like, I did my time, I'm mature, I'm full back, I'm laid back, I talk to the kids, but shit happens so quick where it's, Easy to say, but shit happens. Like I be with mice, mice gets death threats all the time. Like if we out and a nigga come at him, we gonna defend ourselves, and us defending ourselves might turn into us trying to kill us, nigga. You know what I'm saying? There's a yeah. No, I, I feel like you. so it's hard. This and but shit happens just like that. Like like that shit happens, and yeah. you in some shit. And sometimes you when shit happens, you oh shit. Boom and and he you hit it, bumped his head and he died. Oh yeah, I mean, you know what I'm uh, saying? Like, you know, you know, Snoop. Uh, worst day of my life um, as a child. What, um, run into a fight, didn't have nothing to do with me or nothing, and she was fighting, trying to fight her way out of the crowd, and with a bat. And I was standing on a curve, like in the street. The fight was going on, t on, on on the side of the curve. And I was standing right here and started swinging a bat. And phew, grace after midnight. That was that was her murder right there. She liked that. Hitting a girl in the head with a bat. There was no gun involved. There was no knife. Technically, a bat is a lethal weapon, but... It's not what you think, you know. What I mean, most my thing think. is, I try to avoid situations and people that may put me in situations that may have violence. It's like, yo, a lot of times, motherfuckers hit me, yo, let's go such a where? 
Nah, it's nothing good happening over there. And it's not that I'm bougie or I'm not keeping it hood. I'm trying to stay alive and stay safe and not put myself in a position where I feel like my manhood is being tested and my egos, you know what I mean? Like nobody wants to be played out. And now with social media and people filming everything, it's like, yo, like some of the shit they did to Hell Rail, like I was locked up with Hell Rail. Like I don't know what all is about, but like that shit is crazy when some of the shit they did on tape, like that shit is wild, bro. Okay, like at the I, diner when that Yeah, when like that attacked. shit is wild. Like that shit when you a real motherfucker, like that shit ain't gonna sit right. Like that's not you attacking me on camera in front of my family, that's not gonna sit right with me. So as sharp and smart as I am and don't wanna go back, that ain't riding. Like we gonna have to figure something out. Cause I'm like that I ain't never been a sucker. And this is it's like, yo. Just because I'm not trying to go back to jail and I'm smart, I'm still a man and I stand on my square. And I'm going to stand on what I believe in. And I'm going to die for what I believe in. And I'll go back to jail for what I believe in, bro. Like, that shit is camp. Like, when these motherfucking part of me, but when these crackers know you're scared to die and know you're scared to go to jail, then, then you might as well just keep taking a foot in your ass. Is there anything that someone could say to you that can make you pull out a gun and shoot them? Nah, I will hold. So I'm not gonna, I, I, no, I can tell you because I don't walk around with guns. Okay. I don't own a gun. I don't have one in my home. I don't own a gun. I okay. don't fuck with guns. If there was a gun right there on this on this chair next to us, and I told you, I so. would have been moved the chair. <laughs> <baby>. <laughs> the chair would have been going like, "Yo, you bugging? That shit is cool, nice one." Like, but yeah, I, like I don't want to be around. I get in trouble with guns, Vlad. So at this point, Vlad, you're think about it. it. Gun probation. Gun, probation, house arrest. What do you do with guns? Shoot people. Next thing, gun, gun, boom. A, B, C. It adds yeah. up. Well, guns I, and me is trouble. Yeah. I mean, I, I own guns myself. But you don't shoot people. I don't, I don't shoot people. Or at least people. you don't get caught. <laughs> well, and when I go out, I have actual paid security with legal guns. And but I, you got money too, And, and right? I expect them to shoot someone if, if we're in danger. Right, but you, you know what I'm got, saying. I mean, a lot like, of people, like for example, like don't the, have the finances. Right, right, like for example, like I don't know if you saw that video of Adam Twenty Two. You know, of No Jumper, he got a, some ki crazy kid pulled a gun on him, like live on on live stream, like literally pulled a gun on him and, and what pointed happened? at his head. They ended up beating the dude up and subduing him. Until the was it at came. like a gas station or some shit? Nah, oh, okay. Nah, this was this was live on video, station. and I'm watching this video going, and I guess he had his man there as like kind of security, whatever. And I'm watching this video going, if my security was there, he would have shot that kid in the head because this is a clear, we are now in self-defense. Like there's a gun <laughs> at your client's head. It's time to kill this person. Like there's My no shit is this. I don't want to kill nobody. I don't want to be killed. Like if you don't have a gun, you can't shoot nobody. True. Can we come to that understanding? You could also, but you could stab somebody. That's you could, true. You could However, hit somebody with a weapon. You could punch somebody and kill them. You definitely. However, I got little hands, and I ain't never hit nobody and killed them, and I hope I never do. So I'm gonna go with that. And like yeah. people be, you know, it's a lot of my man say, "Oh, but yo, what if you gonna do? You rather get caught with it than without it?" I'd be like, "Bro, listen, if I get caught without it, you know what I'm gonna do? You know what I'm doing with that? My best, bro." I'm gonna do my best. What you gonna do if niggas if niggas busting here and attack us? What we gonna do? Our best. Yeah. Right. We gonna try to survive and make it out unscathed and yeah. you know and win. Like, like what the fuck? And that's just life. If you don't got the gun, you gonna do your best and try to not put yourself in them type of situations. Like I don't got no beef that I need a gun. Maybe some little Instagram words, but yeah. I hope a motherfucker don't want to kill me from that. Because most of the time when I say foul shit on Instagram, I just want you to get off my page. <laughs> Leave me alone. Well, now we have the situation with Nipsey Hussle. Have you ever met Nipsey yourself? Yes. Yeah. I got a t-shirt I wore the other day with a picture of me and us. Me and, me and us. Me and him. Good dude, man. I interviewed him once. Nah. Nah, that's an understatement, bro. Beautiful soul, bro. Like he was different, Vlad. Like, listen to me, bro. Like, Mice is my nigga. And Mice is doing amazing things. But he was different from Mice. You know what I'm saying? You feel what I'm saying? And my I'm dying for Mice. He was different, bro. Like, 
they took one like his just his spirit was different, man. His energy was different, and you know how I know this, bro? Cause I ain't know him like that. I cried for like fifteen minutes this morning. It's two, three days later, and I don't know him like that. We met two, three times. You know what I'm saying? Kicked it. What's up? You know, chopped it up on some music shit. We gonna do a record for sure. Hit me, exchange numbers, and you know that was that regular industry shit. You know what I'm saying? But it was still a connection, yo. Like, nah, some was a real one, man. And it's like, he didn't do nothing wrong. We could argue he could have been smarter about it, not said nothing, or this somebody else could have said it. But at the end of the day, he didn't do nothing wrong. He, where he came up at, what he knows, he didn't do anything wrong, lad. Like, he didn't do nothing wrong. If that man, if he told him, man, yo, you not welcome around here because you did wrong, you didn't, you did bad, you ratted on somebody. From what I'm hearing, if that's what happened, he didn't do nothing wrong. See, that's what happens. These dudes be sometimes it be real official street guys, but they can't do the bed, so they tell. And when they tell, they know they're not supposed to do that. So that mirror is ugly to them. Mm. So when you make mention of it, you reminding them of the ugliness, and some niggas can't hold that. So it's like, yo, you told on somebody and mad at me because I'm calling you what you are. Like, that shit is crazy. He didn't do nothing wrong, man. Like, he didn't do nothing wrong, bro. Like, that shit is so sad. That girl, his woman got to wake up without him forever. Like, her, 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 her man, like, she, like, that shit is so sad, man. I mean, when you look at that situation, It's kind of similar to your situation. Two people that know each other, because from what I understand, they knew each other. They knew each other. Shitty Cuz was a dude that Nipsey knew. Some words got exchanged between the two of them. Somebody felt, you know, somebody felt insulted. They went and got their gun, came back, and committed a murder, and then went on the run. They when you look at that run. situation, so many similarities to what happened with you on the other side of right. You were the shooter. But the difference with my shit was, to, I look at my shit like when when the altercation actually got to it, me and him started beefing over the money. Like our shit was some drug dealing shit, like some street shit. It was family members, but it turned into once it started, give me my money and all that. That turned, made it into almost like a drug beef, bro. Like. He didn't lie, call this man out his name. He's saying, bruh, if you're not right and exact, you're not wanted over here. You know that. Vlad, you know that. You ain't a hood nigga, you know that. Homie know that. So it's a little different. Like I, I feel like, like homie was just mad at his cell. Like he was mad because how you right. mad because the nigga called you a rat if you rat it. Right. And, and I and I understand that. I, but I, I, I think like because just... the rats now but want to be running the shoot niggas and be how you how no, but I, you gonna work with the police like we you you, you double trouble I, I, and I, and I understand all that and you're right I don't think Nipsey did anything wrong but I think that it's, it's so important that at, a, at an important time like this to be in, smart in tragedy to be that smart you have too. to look at a situation and look at everybody's role in this situation. And realize, people say it was just words. That ain't nothing, you know. But it's he just something. said something. It's but, something. But it's something. And, and here, die and here's, over words. here's two situations. Every day, your situation in this Nipsey situation, you have two dead people that died over some words. There was no actual physical violence. There was no threat to safety. It was all over some words and the power of words. And I think with social media. You could just go online and tell someone to go fuck themselves and say, I'm going to kill you. You know, I've had DMs saying, I, I got 30,000 on your head. You know, like, like I, I have these, I, I have these DMs and these tweets and, and these emails that, that say that. And people think they do it and they just go about their lives. And people don't, and social media has taken away the, the seriousness of words and, and the power that will last forever in terms of the effects of it. We're never going to bring Nipsey back. We're never going to bring Sean back. All these children who call this these people fathers and 
their women and their parents and all that have a loss that's going to remain forever. But Nip is a king. Like, it's different, bro. Like, I'm not saying his life is worth more than mine's or more than yours or the next person. But we got a responsibility to protect our kings. Like, his movement, his energy, the things he was implicating, he was different. And we got to treat our people differently. That's different. We got to put them on pedestals and protect them, bro. And I feel like it's so fucked up because I feel like he was on that pedestal and he was protected. I feel like nine out of 10 bloods and crips in that neighborhood wouldn't touch a hair on his body and to protect him. But one bugged out motherfucker that can't, you know, pride and ego that can't hold shit correctly or maybe mentally don't, don't, don't grasp shit properly and feel like, oh, this nigga trying to play me. Oh, cuz, you know what I'm saying? Like, you already, then the motherfuckers already poor, broke, wanna be a rapper, can't do nothing right in life at the bottom. What the fuck he got to lose? And that's the fucked up part. It's like, yo, he was doing so much good shit where he came from in the hood. And it's like, we try to keep it real and stay in the hood. But like you was telling me, Chi, like you was telling me, Vlad, when you was like, yo, but he can't be over. Like, he's worth too much now. Like it's sad. You have a you have a multimillionaire amongst the, amongst people that are borderline homeless. You see what I'm saying? If not homeless, I feel you. You know, but there might why, be just staying if, on But if you couches. was there, sometimes that's all you relate to. The fact that you got money, you still relate to that. Like yeah. that's what you know. That's what you feel comfortable around. I got this money just to buy me nicer things, but I'm still here with y'all mentally. Like yeah. he was still. I'm still here with y'all in the trenches. I got some money. Yeah, buy nice things. I don't give a fuck about that. He used to rap about it. He raps about it. Like yo, the chains. Like this is to show niggas I'm enterprising and all that. But this shit ain't about nothing. Before he had all of that, he was talking about it. How man, I don't want none of that right now. It's not time for that. Like that shit is cool. But when it's time, sad man. It's it's sad, you know. And he, he could have opened up a store in Beverly Hills or uh, Calabasas. But or then whatever. he wouldn't have wanted to hang there. Yeah. You know what but I'm saying? He, he opened up his his store in his own neighborhood on Crenshaw and Slauson, and uh, he was there apparently to uh, help out a friend who just got out of prison. Uh, like you see what gone, I'm saying? Like, I'm like just the like, yo, thing. he's gone, man. My brother's gone. Like, the bro is gone. Like, he just says music is dope. Like, his spirit is so dope. Like, that one is whack, man. Like, that's whack, man. And that shit is weighing heavy on me, Vlad. I'm sorry, bro. I'm sorry. Like, that shit is just weighing real heavy on me. You did You did 12 years over, over a murder. Do you feel that this dude's shitty cuz? The, the, the name do you feel that he should be able to do his time and, and get out one day or do you think that he should I'm get saying, the death I, penalty I'm not one that advocate all that jail shit I'm not in the jail like I'm not in the calling pool when they niggas start posting pictures oh this is him get him I'm not into that okay. I'm into street justice or leave it alone like I feel like the niggas that want him get him if you ain't gonna get him what the fuck is you posting pictures for I'm, I don't do the law like I don't do the law. It's so under no circumstances. I don't do the law. Okay. I don't do the. If I call the police, my car got stolen, and I'm just trying to get my insurance shit together. You know what okay. I'm saying? I'm not like Vlad. If is, well, well, let me ask you. So here's an interesting question. You know, he's now captured, right? He's now in protective custody, seven million dollars bail, which he'll never pay. So he's gonna stay in there until his, his trial date or his plea deal. When he was on the run, if you saw him, would you call the police and turn no, him in? I'm never calling the police. Would you handle it yourself? Would you try to kill him yourself? I'm saying, you, you see what I'm saying? You, I'm you, saying you, I, you, I, you, I could tell you this. I'm not calling the police, and I could tell you this. I can't. I'm, I mean, I mean, what the fuck? I don't got no gun. What the fuck? I'm gonna just. Come here, nigga, and just straight, like, you killed Nip? Like, I mean, I don't know, but I know I'm not calling the police. That, I can tell you for a fact. I'm not calling the police, bro. All right, but do you I don't believe in giving black men to the system. I don't give a fuck what he did. And let, like, with the, with the, 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 the R. Kelly, that type shit, I don't know. With the little kids, I don't know. But 
with street, I don't like yo. He got to, I'd rather he got to get rolled on, bro. But I come from but, that, but man. you're not willing to do it. I'm saying I did my time, though, bro. Like but, but, I did but, but mine. See, but, but I here, did but here's mine, the, homie. Here's the. I did, and I can't say that I'm not willing to do it. I could say this. I don't want to go to jail, bro. Right. But if it was the opportunity presented where I was given a free pass and I know I'm not going to jail, I'll do it, step up and do it happily, bro. Right, but, that, but that's not realistic because right. that doesn't happen. But realistically, and, I'm not going to... Like, right, what's the but, chance but, of me seeing him? Right, shit? Well, what I'm saying is is is, is the, the principles that, that you're laying out is is setting up a revolving door into the prison system. It, do, do you see what I'm saying? By By... Trying to handle things through street justice as opposed to I'm saying the legal even, system. My shit is this. Nipsey's dead, right? Yeah. I want my brother back, right? Yeah. Homie's incarcerated. Mm -hmm. I don't feel no better that he's incarcerated than I did when he was on the run. I just want my brother back. I don't care about him. But you, but you like, I don't back. care about justice. I want my, my brother back. Okay. Like, once my brother's gone, you can die. You could go fly. I don't give a fuck about you. Like, I don't know him. Like, that's not my homie where... I'm supposed to go get my gun and ride for the nigga. You know what I'm saying? But on the strength of what he did for the people, if I felt I could get away with it, sure, I would ride. You know what I'm saying? I don't know what I would do. I might hold a nigga for niggas to ride on him. It depends where I'm at if it happened. But if we just going to make up a situation, shit, let me make up my part. Right. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> no, I, I understand. I'm, I'm just saying, though, it's like I talk to so many people and, and I see this I'm mentality. not calling the police, bro. But, but you, you know, I don't believe in putting black men right. in the system. I don't believe in that. I know what happens in there. But, but you... You also understand the ramifications of street justice because whoever if somebody would have killed him that person would end up doing a huge amount of time in prison as well unless I'm, they prove self-defense or whatever else I'm, it's, it's if someone went to go hunt this dude i'm saying it's a possibility but yo it's i mean in life like yo bro he was a king like he might have people that's gonna sacrifice for him yeah you know what I'm saying? Like, that's going to ride for him. And, like, I'm going to do that for my kids, children. Right now, like, I did my bid, bro. I'm 42. For me to have to ride for another man, like, that would be a disservice. But I can't even say I wouldn't do it. Like, that's how I know I'm still got ignorant shit in me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Because... Yo, that nigga's energy was so dope. Like, it would just be like, man, like, why? Like, like I just... I be want to talk to niggas at this point, Vlad. Like, I want to speak to my brother. Like, what the fuck is up? Like, what's going on? Like, why are we so angry? Like, what could he have said that make you just want to end his whole existence? A nigga that's doing so much and you're doing so little. Like, yo, did he lie? Did he lie on your name? If he lied on your name, do what you do. But if that man is telling the truth, bro... How you gonna get mad at a motherfucker for calling a spade a spade? Cause you don't wanna be a spade, then you shouldn't have fucking played cards, man. Like that shit is not that's not cool, bro. But I'm not I'm not calling the police. I'm not with that. I'm not with that. Yeah. Well, I mean it is what it is at this point. You know point. what I mean? Like, that's just where I'm at, you know. I don't prescribe to that, man. I know what it's like, yo. I tell women, you know what I'm saying? I'm never supporting domestic violence. I'm against all that shit. But I tell my black women, be careful when you call the police on a black man because you may be making the call that's his death call. You know what I'm saying? The way shit is now, you might be putting in his death call. You women be mad and emotional and a, oh, fuck that, you getting out or you going to jail, you know, just... Just because they in their emotions and we in our emotions too. When them people come, shit get crazy and you done put this nigga, sentence this nigga to death. You know what I'm saying? Like we as black people, we have to be careful. Like we can't just call the police. Like I don't like how you feel when you see the police. I don't feel any type of way. All right. Yeah. When we see the police, at least me and most of the people, like... We feel less safe. We feel like, oh man, like, and that's damn near every black person, man, I know. No, and I feel you. you know and, what I'm and, and I'm being honest. I'm not just going to say, <laughs> exactly. oh, I'm scared. Just like, no, no I'm not. you shouldn't have. You I, don't, I don't have to. I don't be. have it. Like, I've never really know. had issues with the police. If you got a son as a white man having a son and a black man having a son, it's like, yo, you don't never got to explain to your son 
what to do if he get pulled over. Like black parents got to really explain to their kids, yo, what to do and not to do in the procedure when you get pulled over for a routine traffic stop. Like that shit is a life threatening experience. It could be a life altering experience for us. Getting pulled over for speeding. Like it's different, bro. It's yeah, different. Man. And I'm not saying my life or Sean's life or anybody's life, but homie was a king, bro. Homie, I would have rather them niggas kill me. Straight like that. I'd have rather they kill me, bro. Like he's doing so much. I feel like I'd have rather they took me, bro. Like, damn, for just it's just senseless, man. We got to get our anger issues together as black men, though, bro. We really got anger issues, bro. And I don't know if it's in the water. I don't know what it is. If it's just our upbringing. But black men, we so angry. We're impatient. You know what we want, what we want now. But we very angry over the slightest shit. You know how we get. It could be stepping on a sneak or whatever. What? Little shit turning the arguments about... Who better than Jordan or LeBron to turn into a motherfucker getting shot with us? Like, shit is just crazy. But I got this book, Vlad. Let's check it out. Another Kind of Freedom, bro. It's my autobiography. It's um, it's my autobiography. It's a life, my life story. Um, I feel like whatever walk, if you white, black, rich, poor, whatever walk of life you came from, It'll be parts of this book that you will be able to identify with. Um, you know, I got, I done been into all type of shit, good and bad, you know what I mean? And um, I just poured my heart into this shit like this. I wrote it when I was locked up. It actually ends before I get released from prison. Um, but I need everybody to support. Um, you know, it's just my little redemption story, how I got once in prison, how I got my shit back together, got my life on track. And just kind of tried to change my my thinking, you know what I mean? It's certain principles that I'm going to always stand on, but it's about making smart, mature decisions and, you know, taking responsibility. And a lot of being a man and me and my growth is sometimes I know I'm wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like when you say what you're saying, I know that not calling the police ain't the smartest thing, but that's something that. I'm not chain switching up on, you know what I mean? I'd rather let the criminal walk away. You know what I'm saying? Especially if he ain't harming nobody. Like, my brother's gone already. But listen, chialibx.com, that's the website. Check me out, chialibx.com. You can get the book. We got hats. We got deals on it. If you are um, in prison, it's less for all the bros that's locked up. It's 25% off for all the brothers locked up. We got some hats, like you get a hat for free or some shit if you get some certain, you know, we got all type of specials. Just go to the website, Chiali BX, Another Kind of Freedom, my autobiography, written by me, no ghost writer, no ghost nothing, no other publishing. I did all this shit myself, my bread, like my heart and soul, like this is some shit I really worked on for a while, Vlad, and I appreciate you, you know, letting me, yeah. you know, give me the platform to talk about. You know, we always been good, but... I still, you know, you yeah. Know, I still gotta say thank you. Well, you know, our first, well, our last interview, you know, that we did, I just looked it up. This was back in uh, 2012, and uh, you know, you had just gotten out of prison after doing your 12 years, and I think the the great part is that I've never heard of you going back to prison. <laughs> I haven't heard of you doing anything stupid. Like you stayed on the straight and narrow. Yeah, I mean, you look I'm chill. good. You I mean, look I have my, my moments, but for the most part, like I'm old too, Vlad. I'm 42. But like, a lot of times, you know, these, a lot prisons, of that, the these age, prisons are yeah, revolving doors. Yeah, but man. a lot of that too, to see they don't tell you, is the age demographic. It's like, all right, they say the recidivism rate is high, but why is the recidivism rate not high for homicide, people who commit homicides, like myself? And a lot of that is because more crimes is committed between motherfuckers between the age of 16 and I think 28, then it drops. Then 28 to 35, after 35, it drops more. But if you give me 15, 20 years to first go around for the homicide, by the time I get out, 
I'm past the demographic because all my friends then died, moved, got married. You know what I'm saying? So you not when you're 40, most of the time you're not on the corner slinging and doing the shit that's gonna have you in that revolving door. You know what I'm saying? So that revolving door is usually for motherfuckers with drug cases that's getting them two to fours and them bum ass cases. You know what I'm saying? But that's not a revolving door for everybody. Mo like 90 some percent of the motherfuckers locked up for homicides that go home do not come back. Well, listen, man, I want everyone to go check out the documentary. The premiere in New York is coming. We'll have a date for you soon. We're yeah. going after that. After the, at the after party tonight, we're probably going to sit down and get the New York <laughs> premiere date. It's going to be dope. I definitely yeah, want man. you to come. Definitely coming, um, man. Uh, but it's a very dope documentary. If you enjoyed definitely. watching what you know, what me and Chielly just talked about here, watch the documentary because it's so much more intricate in terms of all the b-roll and the music yeah, and yeah, the footage yeah, yeah. And, and, the, everything. and the book like my, my my autobiography it really i feel like that breaks it down in, in the more depth because it's, it's it's first of all it's my words um you know just being written and you could get into more depth you can you know talk more about it how you was feeling in this angle and that angle and different things um where it's not being edited and time constraint for time mm -hmm. constraints and you know things of that nature. So it's definitely something you want to check out. And it's just, it's just something I did. I like it's something I did like really just all by myself, bro. And like I put all like my money into it and just my work into it. And it just feel good to you know to actually have something tangible that I could see. You know, like I had a book that was written like a manuscript, but I didn't have a book. You know what I mean? To have a fucking book like it's just dope. To have my face on some shit, and I'm a fucking geek, man. I'm a little hype, bro. Congrats, man. Congrats. You know well, Chelly, man, looking forward. Right. Looking forward to more great things from you. Keep keep doing your thing. Keep maintaining. You and, already know, uh, Vlad. You know, keep you talking know. to the kids in the prisons. and I'm talking to everybody in, out. I'm trying to keep them, the ones out, from going in. That's what it you is. You know, and it's just about, you know, just ways of keeping it real and, and keeping it right, too. And that's what we got to learn and, that and, and to keep it right, man. And we got to just let go of the hate, man. But I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity. You already know how we do. Of course, man. I fucks with you, bro. Till next time. Til Peace. Next time.